Hi, I'm Lynn Fishman and I'm coming to you from the 40th Annual International Conference on Wellness and Consciousness Studies. This conference is sponsored by the International Institute of Integral Human Sciences. This is the place to be to get inspired about your life and to leave with practical tools. And I'm so pleased to have our keynote speaker with us, Dr. Anthony Sicoria. And Dr. Sicoria is an orthopedic surgeon in Upper State New York. He has a PhD in physiology and cellular biophysics. And in 1994, Dr. Sicoria had a very life-changing event, which I'm hoping he'll share with our online audience right now. Great. Dr. Sicoria, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Lynn. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened on that day in 1994. In uh, that day in 1994, I was at a family reunion and we were ex uh, having a, a celebration of numerous birthday parties at a communal uh, event for the family. And I was running the barbecue and um, down the ground floor of the building and the party is, is up one flight. And I took a break to go call my mother just to check on her as she was not there. And I picked up the phone and started to call and she didn't answer. And as I started to hang up the phone, I was unaware of the fact that it had gotten quite ugly outside and it was a storm. And as the phone was about a foot away from my face, suddenly the building that I was standing next to got struck and the bolt of lightning came out of the phone and hit me in the face. And when it did, it threw me back like a rag doll. And as I was going backwards, suddenly I felt myself moving forwards and I was utterly confused. And I remember standing there was looking at the phone dangling and I knew that I'd been hit by lightning and I knew that I'd been thrown backwards and so standing here didn't make any sense and just then I'm at the bottom of the stairs and my mother-in-law is at the top of the stairs and I hear her screaming and she's running down the stairs toward me and I felt like a deer in the headlights and I, I was just frozen there and I wasn't sure what had happened or what she was doing. And as she came down the stairs, she was looking to her left and she got right in front of me and, and acted as if I didn't exist. And she quickly turned and went past me. And at that moment, I turned to see where she was going and I saw myself over on the ground and it looked like I was dead. And I stood there for a second and I, I tried to call to them and they didn't hear me and they didn't see me and there was a, there was a person standing behind me to use the phone who, who was getting down on her knees to do CPR. It turns out she was a nurse, just happened to fortuitously be there, which I was very grateful for. And as I'm standing there, I, I'm, uh, my mind is racing and I'm thinking, oh my God, what, what's happened? And, and I noticed several things about that moment was one, there was no emotion associated with all of this. It was very dispassionate. And the second thing that I noticed about it was that I was thinking, I'm standing here, my body's over there 10 feet away and I'm having all of this conscious thought. I'm thinking exactly the way I would normally think in the same verbiage that I would normally think in. And so I was struck by the fact that, oh my God, whoever we are, we always are. We're, we are separate from that body. And at that moment I realized, 
well, there's no point in hanging around here. Nobody knows that I'm here. Nobody can hear me. So I turned to walk up the stairs because I wanted to go where my family was. And as I was walking up the stairs, I'm looking down at the stairs so I don't trip, which is what I would normally do. And I start to see my legs disappear. And, and I was a bit disconcerting as I'm walking up the stairs and my legs are dissolving. And by the time I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. And I remember getting to the top of this first flight of stairs. The second flight goes to the left and I just went through the wall. I passed through the wall into the room where my family was and I made note of the fact that as I was passing over my wife and children, I made note of the fact that I saw her sitting there. She was painting children's faces and there was a child in front of her, one right behind that, one to her left and then one behind her. And there were a number of things that I was able to verify afterwards um, that proved to me that you know, what I saw was not possible for me to have seen any other way except to be an, a true out-of-body experience. And as I got out of the building, things really started to change. I was suddenly immersed in this bluish-white light which seemed almost like, if you can imagine, a crystal clear stream where the light of the sun is penetrating through it and it has a sparkly appearance to it. It was like that. And the, the most striking feature of it was, if you can imagine absolute love and absolute peace, that's what this feeling was. And I had fallen into a river of pure positive energy and I could see the energy, which was really striking to me because this, the energy almost had form and it looked like little tiny strings that were going through everything. And I realized this energy of love, as, I, as it felt, was whatever the universe was, this is what made it up. This made up everything. And at that point, I had a short life review of high points, low points, and just flashed by as a collage of pictures. And then I was being carried someplace else, and I could feel that. But then, right at the moment that I realized this was the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody, I was instantly back in my body, and I was very unhappy about it. It was very painful, where the lightning had hit me in the face and went up my foot. And I felt awful. And I was angry because I had been made to come back. And I, I remember thinking in my head, please don't make me come back and do this. But at that point I realized I don't have a choice. And it, it took me several minutes to actually wake up enough to open my eyes. And as I did, I, I saw the nurse next to me who was trying to help me and I wanted to thank her. Um, but when I opened my mouth, the only thing that came out was, it's okay, I'm a doctor. And she quickly said, y you weren't a minute ago. Right. So I, at that point I realized I wasn't thinking very clearly, so I just shut up. And everybody came to help me get up. And then I went up to the floor where everybody else was and my wife and family took me home and I saw my, my physicians um, at my hometown and I had refused transport to the emergency room because my thinking at the time was, you know, if you get struck by lightning and you're alive, then that's it. You know, you're either alive or dead and there's not much in between. And at that point I went, went home and, and spent a week recovering and thought, you know, what exactly happened and why did it happen? Why is a big question, isn't it? It's a huge question. It's a, I mean, when I look at 
the probabilities of of all of these events happening, like being at the phone at that moment, having a bolt of lightning pass through a building so that it lost some of its current and enough to kill me, but not enough to fry me. Right. Um, to have a nurse standing there waiting for this event to happen mm -hmm. so that, you know, God in the universe wanted to make sure that that I didn't really right. It wasn't didn't permanent. really leave permanently, um, and and then to not have any truly devastating effects from it. Right. No residual. Uh, I mean, it was. You know, I'm sure that there is some. I mean, people say that I'm not the same person I was then as I am now. So I'm sure that some things got rewired. You know what I love? Tell us about your music. Tell us about how you got interested in classical piano when it was totally out of character for you. And how did that all come about? About two weeks after the lightning event, I started to have an insatiable desire to hear classical piano music, which was absolutely out of my character. I was a kid of the 60s and all I knew was rock and roll. Um, I did have an exposure to, exposure to piano at age seven when my mother insisted that I take piano lessons at age seven and I hated it so I never would comply and eventually she gave up. And so I really didn't know anything about piano or classical piano to, to fill a thimble. <coughs> but suddenly I, I had this incredible desire to hear it and it was so strong that I was moved to drive all the way to Albany an hour away to get a CD of classical piano music and the, the CD just kind of jumped off the shelf into my hands and it was Vladimir Ashkenazi playing his favorite Chopin. I was so smitten with the music I, I couldn't stop listening to it. I made my family listen to it I made everybody at work listen to it. It played all the time. And within a couple of weeks of that, I suddenly came to the realization that there's not going to be enough to listen to this. I need to be able to play it. And so that was a problem because I didn't have a piano and, and I didn't know how to play. And But that didn't seem to matter. And the next day, we get a phone call from our babysitter who says, I'm moving away and I have an old piano, could you keep it for a year until I get on my feet? And I was like, wow, that's pretty weird. Um, I'm thinking I need a piano and suddenly right. one appears. Right. And so she brings the piano over and, and I buy some books to teach myself how to play, which another magical thinking. Uh, but I was determined to do it. And so I would start at 4 in the morning and I would try to teach myself until 6.30 when I went to work and then I would pick up again when I got home. But I was absolutely driven by it and, it, and I had the thought that the only reason that I came back from the dead was because of this music. Mm -hmm. So it was an important part of my life at that moment. And then within a couple of weeks of that event, I have a dream. And in this dream, it's like an out-of-body experience. I, I walk out onto a stage and I see that my body is at a piano and I'm giving a concert at a big concert hall. And as I walk up behind myself, I'm, I'm looking at me playing and I realize that, oh my God, this is not somebody else's music. This is mine. And I listen intently to what's being played. And the ending is kind of loud and has an abrupt end. <clears throat> and I woke up and it was 3.15 in the morning. And I thought, okay, this was way too weird. And I went out to the piano and tried to plunk out some of the melodies, but I didn't know how to write anything down and I didn't know how to play it. So I just went back to bed. But every day after that, whenever I sat down at the piano, 
the music would come alive in my head and start playing again. And this was a ritual that seemed to be part of every day and wasn't to be ignored. And I would write down little pieces of paper, some of the notes as I tried to teach myself and I just put them in a drawer thinking that someday I would do something with it. Well, last <coughs> night, everyone in our audience had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Sequoia play some of his symphony. And it was very moving, very emotional. Some parts I found very emotional. And I wanted to ask you, do you feel your music reflects your life? Does it reflect part of that near-death experience? I'm not sure exactly what the music reflects. Um, I know that lots of people who listen to it have a true effect. I've seen people cry. Mm -hmm. I've seen people who've said they see visions. They have been all sorts of different reactions to it. Um, and so I, I truly believe that there's something important in the music, in the frequencies of the music, that that can apply to other people. 100%. Sitting in the audience, I, I truly felt that. It was wonderful. And I'm well, so glad that I had the pleasure to listen to you play in person. One of our audience members, our viewers, <coughs> asks, how does the music come to you? The music comes usually in form. <coughs> in other words, the first piece came in a dream. So it was given to me in block, and it was my job to eventually write it down and to learn how to play it, which was not a small undertaking. And, and that was the piece I played last night for the conference. There have been other pieces that when I sit down at the piano, music comes to me, but it's, it's usually around an emotional moment or an emotional topic. So if I just sat down at the piano to say, I'm going to write X, Y, Z, I doubt something would come. But if I, if I do it when I'm emotionally wrought about something in specific, then the music seems to be accessed. I'm, it's like I tune into a frequency and the music just pours out, and I can't write it down fast enough. Wonderful. <clears throat> Let me ask you, what insights could you share on life and on death after having gone through what you went through? I learned more about life after death than I, than I knew about it before. <clears throat> and I think there were a lot of things that I took for granted before my dear de near death that I don't take for granted any longer. And I look at things very differently. I'm much more spiritual than I was before. Um, and my spiritualism doesn't particularly align with known religions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay too. I have much more compassion for people and I'm much more willing to look at not what's actually there, but all the circumstances around it and the things that are underlying whatever activity is that I'm looking at. So it's a, it's a very different way of looking at life in general afterwards. Mm -hmm. One of our viewers also asks, <clears throat> how can we deal with our fear of death, and particularly if we're dealing with losing a loved one? Rest assured that there is nothing more wonderful than the love and peace on the other side. And it's nothing more than a veil. And I was so amazed that when I had that experience, I didn't feel anything happen. It was just one second I was in this body and the next second I was out of it. And I was confused. And I, I really didn't know that I had died <clears throat> or that I had separated. I, I didn't understand it. But the most amazing part of it is the absolute love and peace that you feel 
on the other side when you don't have this reality to hold you down. Thank you.